Hi everyone, thank you for joining our webinar tonight. Um, just before we get started, there's a couple of things just to let you know about in terms of the technology that we're using. I know most of us are probably fairly familiar with how a lot of this stuff works now, um, but we just have a couple of pointers for you. If you've got a question, you can certainly use the question chat window there that you see in front of you and submit your questions that way. If you want to hide the control panel, if it's getting in your way, just click on that little orange arrow that's up there on the left hand side of the screen, just above the microphone button and you can press it again, it'll reappear. We've muted everyone just to avoid any of that background noise interference and also because we're recording the session and we can share that with everyone afterwards. Um, so I think that's it. So I'll hand over to you now, Ben, to introduce yourself and Jazz and host tonight's webinar. Thanks very much. Thanks, Astrid. Uh, yes, welcome. I'm Ben Raskin. Uh, I'm Head of Horticulture and Agroforestry at the Soil Association. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this uh, Cut Flower Growing Organic webinar. Uh, the, it's supported by the Fabulous Farmers Project. So this is Functional Agricultural Biodiversity. It's a multi-partner European project uh, which is designed to support farmers in the transition to more agroecological practices on their farms. The, uh, this is the second webinar on cut flowers that we've organised, the Organic Growers Alliance and the Soil Association have organised. The first one was more focused on supply chains and on markets. This one is a more uh, growing focused one. Now, obviously, the organic market has been growing now for around 10 years and the demand for British grown flowers is also uh, in, in, in big growth. So now I guess is the time to be tapping into these two, two areas of growth. And uh, so whether you're an organic vegetable grower that's maybe looking for new crops uh, and new opportunities or whether you are uh, already a flower grower uh, and interested in the organic side of things, uh, I reckon tonight we'll give you some guidance. So uh, thank you, Jez, for agreeing to come and share your knowledge and experience. Uh, you cool I come, Ben? <laughs> Jez is the grower at Dalesford Organic Farm. Uh, he took over running the market garden, uh, actually that I set up five years previously. Jez took it over in 2008. So it's been going for, I worked out nearly 20 years now. Uh, he's a hugely experienced uh, organic grower. Uh, I think we're in for a real treat. The way we're gonna run the session, it's gonna be quite informal. Um, we, I'll be asking sort of occasional questions of Jez throughout the hour. Uh, so those could be your questions. If you've submitted them, uh, I'll also probably be throwing a few of my own in. He's going to be talking about some individual flower crops, uh, as well as some of the more systems-based sort of things like rotations and fertility. So do sort of get your questions going as soon as you feel the urge through the question box. So welcome, Jez. Tell us, uh, well, tell us about what you're up to. Yeah, well, welcome. Um, we're in the middle of Christmas uh, wreath making season. So as you can see, I've got my big afro of wreath here behind me. And uh, that, that's where my journey into not eating crops started, I think, at Dalesford. A uh, bit of background about me and Dalesford. I've been at Dalesford since 2008, as Ben says. And um, my responsibility is to supply the Dalesford brand with horticultural products, be it um, salad leaves, herbs, field crops. Uh, but more recently, since 2017, we've been asked to supply cut flowers into the business um, and more uh, plants for plant sales, which is good because it means that a relatively small propagation facility that we had at Dalesford has, has burgeoned because it has much more uh, requirements beyond things like tomato plants and squash and courgettes and those things that I don't buy in from a third party. We, we buy in a lot of our field crop transplants from Wessex plants. Um, but to, to justify the expense of heated benches, um, we are growing a wide range of, of, of flowering crops. And it's amazing when you get into cut flowers, the diversity out there, and it can take a lot of your time and confuse you, but um, it's, I've got a few ideas and pointers as to which crops to bother with and which what which crops not to bother with 
So back in 2017, the elephant in the room at Dalesford was the, the garden room, which is this beautiful um, kind of plush space full of cut flowers, but they're all from Holland, nothing organic about them at all. And it's still a bit of an issue, the supply chain for uh, flowers, because a lot of the, uh, the propagation material isn't organic. There's, there's no such thing. Well, there are a few people in the, in the world selling organic bulbs, but they're generally dominated by Dutch non-organic supply. Uh, very few cut flowers. I'm sure you, you look at um, the Tamar Seeds catalogue, those guys, that if it's organic, they'll find it. If it's worth growing, they'll find it. And it's a very limited uh, list of opportunities. Um, but the ones they do choose, they're very good, very good. So um, how do you get into growing cut flowers? Well, I'm very lucky at Dalesford. The Bamfords who own the brand, they have plenty of money. So if you you have an idea, if, if my boss has an idea, then we, we get in a consultant. And we ask the land gardeners who are quite famous on Instagram, I, I think. Um, they're kind of the equivalent of Florette. Florette is this uh, threat farm, is this person, this brand in America, who um, is very good at cut flowers. I'm sure any of you cut flower growers know all about her, but the land gardeners, Five, four or five years ago, they were they were very big and very into British cut flowers, which is a, moving away from things like gerberas and lilies and more into cottage garden, uh, classic English garden classics uh, that most people are familiar with and can get, have a stab at growing. So um, we went to the land gardeners and they created this beautiful document, which was a, a list of a seasonal opportunities. They presented them this document in two ways like monthly opportunities so not just things that you you can specifically grow but things that you can forage and when you are based on a big um we're on a 2000 acre estate farm there's lots of woodland um there's ornamental gardens there's all sorts of opportunities that we had to to take over um floristry for ourselves uh, and in the first year, back in 2017, before we started sowing seeds properly and growing flowering crops, a lot of what we did was based on things like what things that we could find. And for, for once, bolting crops, bolting chard, I celebrated bolted rainbow chard. Um, shepherd's purse, who would have known that shepherd's purse, when arranged like appropriately, looks like gypsophila. Uh, Phacelia, Phacelia has got a vase life about a week. I mean, I had no idea, uh, but, but rocket, um, sprouting broccoli, uh, sprouting uh, bolted mustards that we grow a lot of salad grass, because in fact, mixed leaf salads are a big crop in the Dales Market Garden, but, but bolted mustards and rocket, they make a delightful four or five day display if you keep the water, the water well changed, obviously. These things you learn. <clears throat> You also learn never to spill vase water on yourself. That's a horrible thing because it always stinks. Uh, and we, so our journey into um, to, to flowers and and and, and floristry. I, I I like to think of it as native floristry. Make it up as you go along, floristry. Uh, we were given the impetus by um, we were given eight to ten big vases that we had to put around the store each week the main Dalesford store in Kingham and the whole idea was that we would uh, twice a week we would we'd go out and we'd forage bits and pieces and that there you go that's what we can do with just having a little rummage around in the hedge and the fields and that was a really great way to get going and at 25 pounds a hit for us as a team it meant I could budget to employ a, a florist essentially or a member of staff to do that kind of thing so that was um that was that was great and then we got going with the first annual crops and the, the cornflowers, the snapdragons, uh, what have you, they started to kick in and the journey started, the dahlias, um, all these things happened. As we've gone on over the last few years, we've uh, realized that one's enthusiasm to grow flowers uh, means that you can all of a sudden have loads and loads of crop in the middle of summer. And to be honest, people aren't that bothered about going, buying cut flowers in the middle of summer, especially certain sensitive short-lived flowers and um, we got into a lot of trouble with the way we supplied the garden room within Dales because they, for example I, I am growing the crop be it vegetables be it flowers be it 
herbs, I sell them to the business and we would cut every day or every couple of days flowers and take them to the garden room. But suddenly, I mean, it was like, oh, actually it's gotten really warm this week and we have actually got 400 peonies to give you twice a week. And it's, what are we gonna do with these, Jez? We can't sell these. We can't, we're not gonna pay you a quid each for these. So we've, we've kind of uh, re-engaged with the florists at Dalesford and now it's quite useful because I support half the market garden team supports half the wage of one of the florists and the florists do all their own harvesting which is great because all we have to do is the growing and it means that there's very little wastage uh, and they'll harvest one day condition overnight and it goes into the shop the following day or is sent to London on a Monday or a Thursday. Um, we've, we've had some few challenges my boss is particularly uh, finickety about certain things she likes pastels she doesn't like things she may she may make up in her mind that she doesn't like a few things like she she originally hated the idea of dahlias she now has been told by various people who are fashionable that dahlias are cool so they're back in because they're a piece of cake to grow um and i've also got carried away with the whole idea of dried flowers i've got into a lot of trouble this year because uh, i thought dry flowers was the way that we can do organic flowers all through the winter because obviously you don't get flowers in the winter, not, not that many flowers in the winter. You've got Vibernitinus, I think that, that's what we've got at the moment. Um, so I went big on dried flowers and then I was told, what's this dried flower stuff everywhere, Jez? So um, watch out for getting too carried away with dried flowers. Things like yellow status and um, everlasting flowers, they're, they're kind of, they are very prone to people going, yeah, I like them every now and again, like once every five years, I'll buy things like that, but it's not a staple like sweet peas or roses. Anyhow, I so, digress. Jez, just, uh, just yeah. interested in that kind of evolution in a way from you as, uh, as a vegetable grower to a, to a vegetable and flower grower. And one of the things yeah. that I, was interesting was that kind of how you, uh, and it worked much better when the floristry person was picking and I guess you know would you do you think you would, could be as successful if you if you didn't have that very special relationship with the with the farm shop and with the floristry team there uh, I think that I would have to get up much earlier and get onto the flowers rather than getting up early to do the salads and that's where you have this kind of conflict it's like I, I'm no longer interested in being a beekeeper because you have to tend to be beehives when it's really hot, which is exactly when you need to be irrigating your crops and making sure you're on top of the watering and weeding and things. So there is, there is always been a slight conflict of interest, but um, I think I've always got something better to do than grow flowers, which is the selfish fundamental um, thing behind growing food. Uh, so growing flowers for me has been a realization that actually I can employ a couple or at least one more person in my team and they're not always doing flower stuff and it's a hell of a lot easier than growing carrots so that's that's one of the main reasons I've got into it it's come from a, a expanding the budget opportunities of, of my department so I can employ more people very much in the kind of way subsistent farmers in in developing countries do. The more people that a grower like me employs, the less hard work I will actually have to do. Which sounds a little bit lazy, but uh, I'm getting a little bit older now, it's inevitable. And in terms of fitting them around, so you mentioned a little bit about uh, sort of cutting bolted crops, but you know, that, and I'm guessing you'll cover some of this as we go through, but how do you how do you sort of work out what goes where and how to fit in? And there's one question that's come through from Joel about sort of software or you know planning techniques so how do you sort of juggle all of that because you know just growing the 50 different vegetables is difficult enough if you're then sticking another 30 flowers does it get that much more complicated uh well not really because i've got 30 acres to play with so the area that i have been told to grow flowers in is the, the part of the market garden which is very close to where the public come and go and there's um there are it's near the offices it, it, it's the most high profile easy to notice part of the market garden so i don't really have a huge problem there because i will have um no dig permanent beds 
I will have permanent beds that I will mulch with straw or, or my pets. And I will have strips that I can get the tractor down and turn around at one end and I will cultivate and just cover with pre-burnt hole my pets and plant annuals into. So I don't have a huge issue in terms of um, planning. Uh, I think it's more of an issue when it comes to incorporating the flowers into the polytunnels because um, they are, it's very lucrative when you can grow flowers in, in polytunnels because you get a lot of repeat cutting, especially with things like um, sweet peas, zinnias, you just get this relentless summer long um, reproduction of more and more flowers that gives you so many more opportunities than um, quick burst catch crops in, 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 in tunnels like rocket and coriander. So it's it's for me it's more about yeah the, the tunnels that that that's where I have to do most of my planning because I have quite large areas to fill. Yeah, great. So the first group I think you wanted to cover was bulbs, and by a happy coincidence, there's also one of our first questions was about bulbs. So maybe once you're talking about them, you might think about this, which is from Kim Stevens, which is do you have a solution for growing perennial flower bulbs and using the beds again in the summer after the leaves die down? Or do you not worry because you've got so much land that it's not a problem? Uh, well, interesting, uh, interesting point. So I'll just, I'll just recap a minute. Uh, four groups, that I just wanted to, uh, uh, there's so many angles to start with um, growing cut flowers. I've reduced this conversation to four areas, bulbs, perennials, annuals and protected crops. Bulbs, I've kind of got into mainly because that is it's this time of year. So bulbs means that you can have flowers or floral offerings, as we like to call them, um, through the winter. You can use your heated benches in your propagation space. You can get them started in your warm shed, in your house, in your outdoor toilet that's got a heater in it. That's something we do at work. Um, and you can get, really get going with potted narcissi, hyacinths, muscari, fritillary. Um, and then, but you can also, during September, October, even November, uh, we'll be planting tulips and daffs, camassias and alliums uh, outside in the in the, in our no dig beds predominantly. And uh, to answer that question, the tulip bed you see in this slide here, uh, when the, all those tulips were pulled up, um, I, I'm quite disturbed to see that many blooms in a tulip bed because obviously the uh, the one the person making money should pick the tulip before they open up. But when those tulips had finished, we planted cosmos over the top. So, uh, yeah, the whole thing about um, planting annuals over bulb beds is just make sure that if the, normally when the bulbs die back, you've got some stalk um, like present to make sure that when you dig a hole, you're not going to damage the bulb underneath. So you, you either specifically plant bulbs with gaps in between so you can fit in uh, annuals to plant over the top or um, you risk just chucking them in on the top. Anyway, let's get back to bulbs before I was uh, disturbed there. Uh, yeah, so the season starts and um, we have got quite into the whole paper whites thing. I don't know if you know about paper whites, guys. Paper whites are a daffodil that or narcissi that will respond to water and um, warmth. And you take this bulb and you put it into a pot, it would be a pretty terracotta pot. It can be a nice rice husk pot. And um, within, after six weeks, six to eight weeks, depending on the water and temperature, you've got a flowering scented um, narcissi in the winter. It's, it's quite a revelation. Sorry if that's, if that's uh, old news to you guys, but that that's the kind of thing that we, we're getting started with now. Um, it makes a big, it's actually quite a significant part of the season because you're relying on these potted bulbs right the way through from, from Christmas, uh, mid-December, um, or actually even right now, uh, right the way through to, to middle of March. And it's not until you get into the warmer days of March that the tunnel crops that you've been growing, uh, like the anemones and the tulips, they start to kick off and the season uh, beyond containers can really begin. Um, but a lot of these bulbs, tulips, it's, 
it, it's an unusual thing. When you buy tulips from the uh, the Dutch lorry, they are generally quite small headed, um, and as a result, they're like that, so they travel easier and they have they've basically got better life. We tend to grow bigger varieties, um, which will be up to half a meter long and quite have quite big heads, and that. Those are the kind of varieties and the the fancy frilly varieties you want to be focused on to get um, get people's attention to convince people to spend some somewhere in the region of uh, seventy to a pound per stem. And that is the great opportunity you have with with things like these bulbs. They cost about twenty five between twenty and twenty five pence each. There's companies Parkers and Peter Nissen. They're the they're the they're the main ones. Anybody else like Sarah Raven and, and Bloms, you're looking at sig spending significantly more, so you're probably not going to, to use them. And we uh, we started out with the tulips because we, we do 10,000 and we had 40 varieties and we quickly learned that they're not all going to make you money. And you need, you need to be careful because at 20 pence each, you, you want each one to give you something. And I have to sell it into the business at 40 pence. And they'll sell it for pounds, so I have to be quite careful um, how to to make sure those varieties are, are celebrated. The I, I'll quickly give you a few: few. Monton, um, Ivory Florid Floridale, Apricot Impression, Pink Impression. Great big beasts. Uh, occasionally, you get very excited about um, the, the the smaller parrot types and the peony types, but generally that they're, they're, they're short. And it is it's hard to sell um, a flower for good money if they're a short stemmed flower. So if you're going to go for engaging with with customers at a farmers market, um, they generally want something a bit bigger. And um, yeah, there's definitely a few varieties to focus on there. Um, alliums, we've been doing Hang a on, lot Jez. of alliums. Sorry, Jez. Sorry, Jez. Before you move on to alliums, a couple of tulip right. questions. Uh, well, one from Sinead Fenton, are you lifting and reusing the bulbs or treating them like annuals? And then a sort of follow-up one from Christina Campbell, surprised to hear it sounds like you cut your tulips and leave the bulb in the soil. I've always believed uh, that you just pull everything up, bulb and flower, and store in the chiller. Okay, yeah, so the the the, the thing is you, with um, cut flower tulips, you, you harvest the, the maximum length. So if you can pull it out of the ground, then you get an extra 10 centimeters of stem length and you, you generally harvest it on the bowl. Uh, what we found, uh, which was a bit, which is to do with our clay soils actually, is that sometimes the bulbs, um, that they get stuck so that they snap. Uh, that For that reason, I, I don't tend to uh, just cultivate the old tulip beds. I, I will keep them because I know I'm going to get a flush of smaller uh, tulips the following year uh, and they're very relevant so you can make small hand ties with the with the, the tiny tulips and they're quite delightful actually because um obviously in the spring as many tulips as possible really so um yes with tulips you do destructive harvest which is a horrible thing but that's 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 the reality of it guys and if I'm buying them for 20 pence, selling them for 40 pence, I need to really have very few failures. Um, I'm just very lucky to be part of an enterprise that can tolerate that, but I do celebrate any failures, as in if um, if the bulb do stay on the ground and they flush again the following year, because I'll overplant with annuals in the summer, we've got two bites of the cherry, and we always like two bites of the cherry, don't we? Uh, summer bulbs, just want to point out summer bulbs. I kind of question the need for summer bulbs because there's so many other things going on in the summer, but something called Acidantara, which you plant in April, May, it, that's an absolute delight, guys. It's, it's slightly scented. It comes in sept from September through to November, which is why it's relevant because you have something at that back end. Um, and they're really easy, like Gladioli. Gladioli, my boss doesn't like, so we don't grow those. Um, and do you know what, Gallioli is so, they, they're here today, gone tomorrow. I just, sometimes it's they're, they're too much hassle because they're, yeah, they, they always come in August when it's hot uh, and it, they're risky. And there's something called Galtonia, the summer hyacinth. That was on our, our recommended list. Don't bother with that, guys. It's just, it's, um, 
has this kind of spike of flowers and there's always fresh lovely bells at the top but often there's dead ones below i mean you, you, you can persist with them they're very easy to grow these bulbs and you can keep them forever as long as you have really really penetrating frost but um uh yeah they um they kind of get they kind of get they can, the florists i think they get fussy and if you give them too many opportunities they say oh no don't bother growing that thing Right, perennials. Any, any any more from you, Ben? Move yeah, yeah. Perennials? One one more question, which I might supplementary answer, but it's around the uh, organic status of your bulbs. So, do you use organic bulbs, or uh, do you get derogation to use non-organic ones? Uh, generally, everything has a derogation. There's no real organic um, propagation material out there. Like I say, the Tamar seeds do a handful of seeds, but that's about it. So I, yeah. I've gone from I've gone from having pretty much three things on my derogation list with the Soil Association every year, to annoying my the farm secretary for a whole day when she sends this ridiculous list to the Soil Association, and they're always obliged very kindly. They give us a lot of stick in the first year, um, mainly over the perennials, which we're about to move on to. And the, and the thing about perennials is they're obviously more expensive expensive to get into but when you're buying an herbaceous perennial a delphinium or a strantia or a chameleon mollus um you're going to engage with a nursery and pay up, well, at least two pounds for your, your starter nine centimeter pot or um so you are buying in dodgy compost that's the sort of association's point of view but um They've actually let it go now because they've acknowledged that uh, generally these propagation, um, th th these small units, they, they take a couple of years or a good year or so before they give you anything. Uh, so you kind of end up with this inevitable um, period of transition. What do you call it? I've forgotten. Convert conversion. <laughs> conversion. Yeah, there you go. Such a long time since I became organic. So herbaceous perennials. We generally grow, we start off every, all the herbaceous perennials through uh, MyPEX. I was very lucky to come across two hectares of um, used MyPEX five years ago. So my, I have had to spend a lot of money on MyPEX, which is delightful. It's always very important to make sure you look after it though and don't rotivate it. Never rotivate MyPEX, everyone ruins machines and it just ends up in the saw, all horrid. So, they're much more expensive to get going with, but I mean, our Camilla Mollis will perform to you, for you from May right way through till um, August, if you look after it. Strantia delphiniums, I mean, who's not going to buy a delphinium? Some people can will spend five pounds on a, spend a pound a foot on delphinium stems, which is why we've ended up growing them in the polytunnels, actually, because uh, why not, eh? If you get them that tall, five foot delphiniums. Scabious coquette cassicus, that's a beautiful thing, that produces all through the summer. Uh, Echinops syringium, opportunities with the seed heads, so even when they finish flowering you can use them, their, their form uh, later on. Uh, Angelica nautia, Japanese anemones, uh, sweet rockets, which is something that we rely heavily on, it's actually a type of brassica, it's more of a biennial actually. But um, that kicks off big style uh, in late April, May, and all these kind of early season and back uh, back end season flowers are they really they should be considered very important um, as part of your mix because it means that you can you've got stuff either end that you've got really longer season as possible. The whole point is like a, a veg box scheme in terms of once you have engaged with customers who know you're focusing on seasonal uh, flowers, you need to keep up. Uh, those opportunities all through the year otherwise you'll, you'll lose them you'll lose your customers uh, uh herbs agastaches um they're amazing mexican agastache mexican yeah sangria that's that's incredible mint hyssop oregano obviously these things are more for the hand tie market but um people love hand ties it's a it's a great art to be able to assemble a 30 stems in a in a hand and present them and to be able to sell something like that for 10 quid and not worry about stem length it, it, it is um is a success and it's all a lot of it's about the quality of how you arrange them and your, the way you select 
the individual stems so they last um, a good week. Bearded iris, very risky. Howards are a great supply. Howards, the nursery in Norfolk, they're one of the best value suppliers of perennial uh, propagation material. Um, they actually supply us with uh, berry irises in September, which uh, that they lift fresh um, the rhizomes and send them out two pound a chunk. Great, it's delightful having iris, but if it's hot in May and June, then again, the crop comes and goes. And um, so don't want to invest too heavily in these in these Horatius perennials that have got quite a limited period of opportunity. It's the same with peonies. I love peonies, everyone loves peonies. And um, when I realised if, you, if the, you actually harvest the peony before it comes into flower, you actually harvest the, the peony when the flower bud is soft like a marshmallow, they don't fall over. So one of the things I, I, I find a bit frustrating with certain cut flowers is that you have to stake them, which inevitably means that as from an efficiency point of view, you end up using uh, stakes every three or four meters or two meters if need be, and you use the polypropylene net, the mesh, the same mesh we use to climb up um, uh, climbing beans in polytunnels. So that reliance on plastics is a bit frustrating. Obviously, one could use natural materials, but you don't because this polypropylene net is far too easy to use. That might be a get out. Roses. This picture shows roses. Now, again, roses cost 15, 10, 15 pound a pop. You plant them at a meter each, and that gives them lots of space. You need to be careful, especially with clay soils like me, don't create too much compaction. We ended up putting this patch of roses in, there's about 200 here, um, planted through the mypex. But the reality is, you've got florists traipsing up and down these areas all through the summer. You actually compact the ground quite a lot, which doesn't do your, your roses any good at all. So in the second year, we actually re replaced the mypex with straw. And we have, because we're basically a, um, a livestock-based farm, we have a lot of wet straw every at the end of every winter. So the big bales of straw break up quite nicely to um, into to slabs. So you get a lot of effective mulch and a lot of effective protection of the soil. And then when you start that kind of every two years using this wet straw mulch in these perennial areas, you will actually create a spongier soil that can tolerate um, the trampling. In retrospect, I don't think I would use my pecs in quite the same way. I would probably give the roses, plant the roses closer together and uh, give more uh, committed pathway. And that has been a real lesson have in perennial areas to, to get committed pathway. And then at least in those, in the beds or the, the growing space, you, if you can come in at a later date and use a broad fork to alleviate compaction, which I pointed out was an issue with our um, clay soil. Uh, I would talk about favourite varieties of roses, but I haven't got all day, so I won't do that. Uh, and uh, yeah, this year I I will always get excited about trying to get ahead of the green fly and roses. Never have a problem with green fly at Dalesford. Um, I have occasionally on some peppers in the polytunnels, but green fly do love to go on roses. So um, I get the savona out, give it a spray. This year I started spraying roses, then I noticed the ladybird larvae, and uh, Joe, was, Joe Wright was pointing out earlier to me how isn't it wonderful growing flowers? It's so wonderful for the predators um, and the pollinators. And she's absolutely bang on. We've got the best uh, population of ladybirds these days. And so I, I stopped spraying um, the soap. And uh, yeah, the next week the uh, aphid problem had, had sorted itself out. So there you go. Roses don't have to be problematic, uh, they're just annoying because. If they get wet on the bloom, even if it's a white bloom, which is a bud that hasn't properly opened, then the, the petals go slightly, go slightly brown. So as a result, we've actually decided to move all our white roses uh, under a, a, a purpose-made open, open-sided polytunnel. But they're worth a quid a stem, guys. And if you've got a, a rose bush, which you, you don't, you try not to take too many stems off um, each plant in the first year. But in the second year, a rose bush can give you, uh, I don't know, 20 stems, and you've got it for five or six years, maybe longer if you look after them properly. So it's it's a good investment, and if you can find 
a grower who knows about which varieties are worth it because some of them are actually very prone to the black spot then then go with those sexy varieties that work well dahlias that's a tender perennial so it's in the perennial section um they are they are they're big they're doubles they're singles they're pom-pom they're cactus all sorts of types but they're a piece of cake to grow it's like growing a potato and you're always going to get something on even in the first year you buy a little uh, uh, tuber from parkers or whoever and they cost the best part of a quid but you're going to make a few quid out of every one of those you'll make a plant which is a good four foot tall uh, and, and you've got it forever uh, to lift or not to lift dahlias i i'm not lifting my dahlias this year how cavalier is that um it didn't really have a the ground didn't have a penetrating frost last year so i'd rather not bother so i've got um uh, we had to replace the curb on a polytunnel this year and i'm going to end up using a couple of bits of old broken up fleece and an old polytunnel cover to cover the daily bed and hopefully that will mean i don't have to lift it again i have to lift them and, and do you get any them. um do you get any slug or mice damage over the winter or not if you leave them in the ground uh i don't know yet we left them in i, I did dig them up last year because the piece of ground they ended up in last year uh gets wet in the winter so they would have rotted so this is the first year i've left them um Ben, but I know other people nearby who just leave them in all the time and go, why are you bothering doing that, Jez? That's a waste of time. And I'm like, well, obviously, I'm going to jump on that bandwagon, aren't I? <laughs> like, uh, so there's also, sorry, a question on getting long stems on roses and dahlias. He says he's tried some of the pruning techniques, but they don't always work. Okay, so um, with, with, with roses, still a mystery to me to be honest i guess it's all about the pruning and limiting the number of shoots um to say 10 in a second in a two-year-old um, plant obviously if you let too many shoots develop then you're spreading that sap flow uh the the fewer shoots you have the longer stem you have some 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 varieties don't seem to let you they they, sleep, they flower at a certain height um, but with with dahlias, there's this thing where dahlia flowers are presented in, in threes, and you, you you work out which is the dominant one, and you take the two wingmen out, and so you have to do this fiddly kind of pinching out business uh, during the dahlia season. But you get much better uh, blooms. Uh, it's pretty much A level that kind of thing, um, as long as the dahlias are well watered and in good condition then people should just get excited about them anyway um i could go on about other uh, perennials hydrangeas lilacs that kind of thing all these shrubs they're quite expensive and they're a long-term commitment but as your journey into floristry evolves you will realize that perennials as people who've started out all this excited growing stuff with high ideals about permaculture perennials the whole idea of forest gardening and having perennial borders um it nurtures the soil it nurtures everything doesn't it so we'll eventually we'll start getting into things like hydrangeas and lilacs but they're expensive and they don't give you anything for years so every year just buy a few and have a, a well weeded perennial shrub border so Go on. And if, before we move uh, Jez, before we move on to annuals, uh, yeah. you have, uh, and rightly so, you've been picked up on this uh, polypropylene netting question, which you tried to duck. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> so, uh, Lisa Gray asks, why can't you use natural products instead of the polypropylene? Is it is it just a cost thing? Yeah, I mean, I, I've kind of moved away from... Um, Polyprop twine over the last few years, the uh, baler twine for tomatoes and things. I'm using a hop twine, which is sisal, and I, and I, I use I use the sisal out in the garden. Um, but the netting thing, it's very hard to get away from that. I mean, I I don't have that. When you have uh, sweet peas, I mean, I could, I guess, I could. I mean, it's a it's a valid question. The whole idea of growing sweet peas up a up a um, 50 meter row of sweet peas up hazel sticks. I could go and harvest those uh, and I could create a supported structure. 
But the when you set up a, a line of net with hooks off a wire from the top of a polytunnel, it's just so easy. Uh, and they it has very consistent support all the way along itself. It's uh, it's a bad habit, I admit. It's a bad habit, I admit, and I maybe one I should get out of. And I think as Delsa moves into being a much more um, user area, as in it's going to be used much more by people um, on floristry courses and things, then I will be under pressure to perform aesthetically, which is all the wrong reasons, actually. I'm sorry about that. But That's it's, fine. Conveni no, it's, it's convenience. Yeah, and there's a suggestion, well, actually a couple of suggestions here. One from Sarah Webb, have you ever used chicken wire? I'm thinking of trying it next year. Um, Fiona Hayes, a bird business, says we use a metal grid that we reuse every year for our sweet peas. And she also made the point that you might need to look out for the slugs when the dahlias start to shoot. Yeah, well, I uh, yeah, I, I realised that. I mean, we I'm actually growing dahlias through municipal waste um, in the beds of municipal waste, and we'll give them a top, we'll give them a fresh dose. Not that that's going to help with the slugs, uh, and I will probably end up, yeah, I will probably give them some ferrous phosphate, little punnet of ferrous phosphate on there, which is the nice slug pellets, everybody. It's just minerals, it's just salts, uh, just applied at the at the right time. Um, yeah, the whole thing with um, with the with the trellis and and the plant supports is when you're doing long rows, that, that that's it. It's, it's great to use all sorts of things. It's, I, I'm talking about volume production, and um, if you start to get excited about volume producers like Florette, um, like Green and Gorgeous, Rachel at Green and Gorgeous, they will all they'll, they'll use a mixture of all methods depending on how many of each crop they're growing. Uh, but that in itself is one of the great things about getting into cut flowers because you're growing smaller numbers of uh, different types of crops compared to field cropping of vegetables that allows us to develop the, the no dig part of um, our enterprise whereas a lot of the uh, because I have this vast space everything else is done on a kind of two meter bed formed kind of space uh, encouraged which encourages cultivation uh, and and weeding through um setups or on tractor based implements anyway let's move quickly on to annuals because um it's very hard to keep um our, our, our kind of concentration levels up on a tuesday night um well it's not a drinking night everybody is it it's tuesday not as drink on tuesday uh hey so the lovely picture of uh, sweet peas sweet peas are the most lucrative of all annuals um uh, what I have found with sweet peas is quite incredible. You get so excited about sweet peas and you, and you buy quite a few varieties. And the reality is, for a 60 meter, our, our polytons are 60 meters long. You actually only want one pea every 20 centimeters. And the reason for that is, if you if you plant too many peas close together, then when you get into the height of summer, they're all competing. The, these plants will get up to eight foot tall. You let allow them they generally don't because you're taking the tops out from the whole time um but if you if you plant too close together you get burnout and it's always incredible when you go to garden centers in april may and you see sweet peas up for sale because there'll be multiple uh peas in a pot and nurserymen do it because they can put a few peas in a pot and within three weeks they've got something that looks like they can sell them but people will then go and just plant them like that and then they're, they're, they're always surprised that the peas don't get very tall it's always important to kind of yeah just um just grow one in a in a in a nine centimeter pot uh ideally you you you, you raise you, you you sow them early around now so that when you get to plant them out in your polytunnel um in in january february they're they're quite well developed root system uh and you you, you pinch them out but yeah i mean we we in the polytunnels we will be cropping uh sweet peas pretty much for 10 weeks which is amazing because the the, the florists will go in there and they'll harvest the best part of 700 stems every day. It's just, it's just incredible. And everybody loves a little bunch of sweet peas. And at that volume of production, you can sell them for four or five pounds a bunch. And people just think, oh, that's, that's nice. I'll have, I'll have those. Make my toilet downstairs loose smell nice. Um, other blatantly obvious um, uh, annuals. Uh, Things like uh, sunflowers, they're a bit unpredictable. 
Uh, but the biggest realization with annuals has been the hardy annuals. So how, what are hardy annuals? They're, they're annuals that can be outside during the winter. So we're talking about larkspur, cornflower, clarisage, scabious, corn cockle, nigella, honesty, ami, poppies, echium, dorcas. If you can remember or schedule in your busy lives to sow these things in September and raise them as young plants and start to plant them out um, into your no-dig beds from October, uh, November. We're still planting a few um, scabious and sweet rocket now, actually. Um, but um, you can actually sit on them until next spring and, and plant them then as well. But you get completely different crops from these annuals if you uh, raise them over winter. Cornflowers, four foot, five foot tall in, in June. Whereas if you sow a cornflower in, in March, February, March, you, you're barely getting up to three foot tall. An absolute revelation, guys. And generally you can incorporate these, um, if you're a veg grower, you can incorporate the, the, this work into your schedule because you, there's not a lot of competition in the propagation space in September. Right, unless you're gonna interrupt me, Ben, I really wanna go on to protected crops. Crack on. There's a couple of questions, but you crack on, and we'll, if we've got time for them, we'll cover them when you're done. Okay. So protected crops. We're using gaps in the in the in the polytunnels. Um, we've got a bunch of polytunnels, and half of them uh, every summer are down to tomatoes. Uh, the other half will be down to cucumbers, herbs, climbing beans, what have you. But introducing flowers into um, the mix is become really quite useful because it, obviously the, the big money is in the tomatoes and the cucumbers and, and peppers and things. But the flowers, it's, um, we have, a lot of our tunnels are on a, a slope. So we have a top edge, which can be a bit too wet when the tomatoes come out. Um, and so we don't really like to rotate that. So you can, you can actually broad fork these edge beds and, and plant, um, the, the uh, overwintered flower crops into them. Uh, anemones and ranunculus. Yeah, anemones and ranunculus. Who knew I'd be excited about those? But they are amazing. This photograph here is of um, anemones. Anemones generally come as a little corn thing and you plant them in September. You can plant them straight into the ground. In fact, they're better if you plant them straight into the ground. I have actually had quite a few rot on me when I've planted them as, raised them as transplants because I have the space available uh, in September in the polytunnel. Uh, we tend to uh, plant these corms or, or the claws of ranunculus uh, about two inch, an, inch, an inch and a half deep. Then we'll flame over the ground. We'll probably put some municipal waste compost over them as well to act as the, the weed suppressing mulch over the winter. But this variety is called Galilee, which is available from Whitman, Whitman Pinks. And they are up to two foot long, two foot long, guys, rather than the anemones that you get from Parkers, which are the, the this, these are the people you normally might go to. Um, they have very limited supply and they probably only go to a foot long, uh, maybe potentially 40 centimeters if you're lucky. But you get this stem length on the anemones and these things are cropping. You plant them in September in the polytunnel, but they're cropping from mid end of March. And it's just such a, a joy to have this bunch floral offering at that time of year. Um, the ranunculus come slightly after that at the end of March, and then the tulips kick in um, at the end of March. It all depends on how warm it is. Um, uh, and then you've got this, you, you hit the ground running with the, with the cut flower season. You come out of the potted, um, bulbs in your propagation tunnel. You're cutting things in, in the in the polytunnels, and then before you know it, you're on to things like wallflowers, uh, sweet rocket, the the flowering alliums, and then the irises and peonies are, are quickly on their on their tails. Anyway, I digress from my favourites, the zinnias. Now at the end of this particular row of slides, I guess it will be called the finish. There is a lovely shot of zinnias. Now zinnias, these are um, a couple of varieties called Queen's Lime Green or something, and I don't know what the other one is, but they are available through Chilton Seeds. And we planted the zinnias in, um, uh, I guess, middle of May, 
Uh, they're, 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 they're a bit sensitive to frost. So middle of May, no, beginning of May, because we were harvesting them in June and we didn't stop harvesting them until October. And they have sh they have vars life um, that everybody gets excited about. They have these ridiculous kind of punk neon colours uh, that everyone notices. Uh, yeah, if you can grow zinnias, guys, if you've got the space in, in, a, in, a, in a tunnel during the summer, it's all about vase life. And the thing about the zinnias is a lot of the summer flowers can be a bit, um, they can fade quite quickly. Even antirrhinums, um, they can fade quite quickly if it's hot. But zinnias won't. And that, that's, the, that's why I'm, I'm so passionate about zinnias. And you don't have to just go for the fancy varieties in the Chilton Sea catalogue, or certainly don't go for Sarah. I don't want to say anything bad about Sarah Raven, do I? Because I shouldn't, can't really say anything bad about anyone in public. Um, but you're going to pay more if you go through Sarah Raven. Chilton Seeds, also quite expensive, but uh, King Seeds, they did the uh, purple prints, and that, that performed brilliantly. Great big long stems, great big blooms. Um, and you think purple. Purple is actually it's purpley pink and lots of colours in between. So, but that was um, that was a real hit because it was just a packet of seeds for a fiver, and we got a couple of hundred plants off that off that one. Whereas the Chilton seeds, they specialise in small amounts of seed. Sometimes they don't all germinate, so you have to buy multiple seed packets. And before you know it, you're spending a fiver on 25 seeds, which is a bit annoying if you are worried about germination success. And germination success, growing your own flowers, that is that is a big deal um, because that can really make uh, this whole journey into flowers feel like a great opportunity. You can have a quite a limited financial outlay to huge gains, like I say, less than 200 sweet pea seeds for what would have been, you know, 6,000 stems, I imagine. Um, but uh, do be wary of uh, spending too much money on on, on certain seeds. Uh, but equally, it's more about whether you have the capability to grow them, uh, to germinate them successfully. And do not get too carried away with those f fancy perennials that you see in the Chilton Seed Catalogue that really are quite impossible to germinate and annoy the hell out of you. Um, and, but there are certain tricks as well. I mean, if you are horticulturally uh, geeky, then look it all up. I mean, with foxgloves, I've sown foxgloves at stupid times of year, February and March. What was I doing that for? You sow them in June, they will germinate. And if you buy pelleted seed, then you can actually see what you're doing. And all of a sudden, you've actually done something quite useful. And you, you thought, oh, I'm not going to buy pelleted seed. That's far too expensive. But in actual fact, you can see what you're doing. It's a, it's a real revelation, these small seeds that you can properly manage and then do a proper job on germinating. Uh, we, I was quite lucky actually, I convinced um, Delflins to germinate a bunch of things for us this year and they did, they did quite well. Um, I've had hundreds and hundreds of everlasting flowers that had a chrysum. And I was like, yay, I'm gonna put dried flowers, we can make fancy Christmas decorations with them. And then my lovely boss said, oh, I don't like those. And that was that. Shane. So Jez, I know you've got a couple of sort of um, roundup points to make. There's a few, uh, actually too many questions now to answer, so apologies if we don't get to yours, but there were a couple of ones around sort of rotations and green manures. So, you know, do you have a rotation for the flowers? And um, what green manure crops can I grow when annuals have died? Quick growing varieties. And I don't know whether that also maybe links into recommendations on good productive foliage. Um, well, to be honest, I don't. The no dig method, the no dig committed beds, when the annuals finish, then we just go in there, dig them over, put some fresh um, compost on top, and, and replant. So we haven't committed to green manure rotation strategy yet. But generally, generally, I. I have realized my biggest error has been trying to commit too much ground. And if you commit to too much ground, you end up letting things go to seed. And if you get things going to seed, some people go, oh, it's, that's great, that, that stuff self-seeds all around my patch, it's wonderful, I don't have to plant it anymore. But in reality, if you've got 
20,000 red poppies everywhere. I mean, no one's going to buy them. <laughs> it's uh, you have to manage your 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 no dig beds with this amazing fine tilth compost that you use really carefully. Otherwise, you just create more problems for yourself. Um, so yeah, in terms of in terms of that, we're not using green manures in that context. Um, green manures for me is a gap filler. So when, for example, onions and potatoes fill uh, finish at the end of the season, I took the cilia down. Uh, if, if I'm got ground that is available that becomes available in in October, then I'll use Italian ryegrass. Um, or long-term fertility building with the clover, which is understone in the brassicas and, and the squash um, during halfway through the growing season. But I don't get hung up about trying to incorporate them into the, the flower element, actually. Okie doke. So I'll let you just finish off before we move on to uh, Joe's little section on the uh, organic flower forum, which we're going to tell you about. So. Yes, uh, closing remarks. Okay, so yes, the whole world of cut flowers is vast and wide. If you can find a mentor, I really recommend it. I really recommend Rachel from Green and Gorgeous and all the all the information she's put out there into the big wide world. She has some great crops to focus on. Try and focus on like half a dozen crops for each season. Um, that really helps uh, horticultural with it, horticulture within us will get carried away with these seed catalog catalogs. It's a real risk, but it's also it's a delight. As long as you've got customers, it's it's worth it, I guess. Um, you can do a hell of a lot of, with it in a small area that's well managed. I, I just alluded to that a minute ago. Uh, and mixing the cropping with annuals on top of bulb beds is is a great scenario to have, um, and it's a great it's a great enterprise to incorporate into a vegetable enterprise because you do a lot more work in the winter all this kind of preparing uh, perennial beds it, it's more more winter work so it allows you to keep staff on um full time during the winter which it certainly has with me um yeah much easier to grow than carrots i hate growing carrots <laughs> now uh and uh if you do make mistakes with your perennials and they do become um Kind of full of cooch, dand uh, buttercup, uh, and dandelions. Then dig them up and move them. Yeah, consolidate your perennials if, if they get weedy after three or four, two or three years. Um, yeah, my biggest thing is keeping the ground aerated with my broad fork in my no dig bed. It's make it's managing and, and sticking to those uh, harvest pathways and keeping on top of weeding. And then you can just enjoy the flowers harvest them early, get those customers, get everyone gushing and excited about them. They love that. And if you, if you can, do pick your own, because then they do it all for you. We'll do a bit of it. Great. Thank you very much, Jez. Uh, and I think your comments about mentorship lead us very nicely uh, into our final session. Uh, so if I can welcome Joe Wright, who's going to tell us about the new organic okay. flower forum. Great, thanks Jez, brilliant talk. Lovely to see when someone so excited about flowers like me. And we, as vineyards, were the crop that got me into cut flowers in the first place. I just wow. saw someone. So yeah, thanks so much for sharing all that. Um, I'm just gonna do like literally three minutes um, on something that we hope might you might be interested in, you as an audience. And this is, um, as Ben said right at the beginning, um, this is the time. This is the time to get into cut flowers. Loads of reasons why, Brexit being one, um, customer preference. Um, we, we, just, we, the, we just want to diversify, it's the time to do it. Um, and I think um, people are interested. So, um, hopefully you can hear me. My my internet signal's not brilliant at the moment, but um, so we've got um, how many? 74 people listening at the moment, and it would be amazing if all of you were interested in perhaps being involved at some point in a forum. So we're just proposing um, that we might start one. Um, the role of the forum would be to share and develop our knowledge base. We've got there's a lot of knowledge out there. Um, it would be nice to consolidate that 
um, but also to learn from the veg producers. You've done a journey, um, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, on developing routes to market, on getting people to buy local, to buy British. There's so much learning among the veg producers that I think flower producers could potentially um, learn from. So just sharing that knowledge to start with. The other role of the forum might be, well, just to develop this critical mass of growers so that we can genuinely offer something. Because I think it's all very well getting people excited about flowers, but there's still not enough of us growing them. Um, we're, we've taken back a bit of market share, one or two percent, but we're still about 85 percent imported flowers yeah. at least. So um, basically to develop a critical mass of growers, be them converting from veg or diversifying from veg or flower growers going organic. Um, also, routes to market. Obviously, that's there's no point in doing it if we can't make a livelihood out of it, if we can't make a decent living. Um, there are, um, it, it's just the same as veg was 30 years ago, probably. We need to, tr it's a very, very perishable crop. We need to find ways to get it to market. Um, be it, um, I don't know, cooperatives. I've got a few ideas, but that would be what we would discuss um, basically in the forum. Um, but yeah, there's there's going to be multiple routes to market, and it would be great to um, really get some consensus. Of, well, it doesn't even have to be a consensus, but some people um, really showing that it can be done, I think. Um, then also, I think this is really important to agree and disseminate the key messages about why organic cut flowers are important in the first place. There's a hell of a lot of greenwashing at the moment out there. There's a lot of people getting on the sustainable florist bandwagon, um, eco florist, sustainable florist, and that tends to mean that they just take the plastic wrapping off the flowers before they Ooh. sell it. There, there is a, a yes, yes. Yes, Jez, it does happen. Yeah. Um, there is a lot of people who are, are actually jumping on the sustainability bandwagon, but they're not really doing it. So I think that we really do need to say this is what organic cut flowers or British flowers are, you know. Um, so sending those messages. So can I have the second slide, please, uh, Ashley? <clears throat> I think there is another slide, and that's a kind of proposed date. I it's don't come, know if I could, yeah, come through. Yeah. It's come so through, yeah. It, yeah, got it, got it. So the the format would just initially, if we're still in this horrendous situation of having to do everything on Zoom, um, we 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 would propose a Zoom. Um, date in January, and I've literally thrown one out as Wednesday, the twentieth of January. Um, this is a grower-led forum. Um, but um, the OGA and the Soil Association, who were brilliantly supporting us now, would still remain in a kind of supportive role um, administratively or, or it just disseminating, um, you know, the information. Um, so really, all my role is tonight is to say, do you want this? Are enough people interested? And I think that it's um, if you were happy to get in touch with the Soil Association to say, preferences around daytime, evening, and um, really just get your names on the list. Does that sound enough, Ben, just to kick it that's, off? Yeah, that's perfect. Thanks, Joe. And um, Astrid's going to share um, a short survey now so that you can effectively join, you know, put yourself forward to join that, but also there might be, uh, there's a couple of other questions just to sort of help us work out who was listening tonight and, you know, the, the opportunities. Um, there's also, if you've, if you've got to rush off now, there is a chance to do that. It'll get sent through as an email as the follow up to this webinar as well. Um, so as Astrid shares that, I'm going to just uh, wind everything up. So thank you very much, Jez, for sharing your expertise. It's uh, delightful to be part of the network. There you are, your first back, member, Jez. <laughs> And uh, thank you, Lovely Jay. Lovely to have you, Jez. <laughs> uh, thanks, thank you. obviously, thanks to for your thanks, obviously, also to Astrid for all her organisation, and to Greta and Jim from the Organic Growers Alliance for helping to organise tonight as well. Greta's been on the uh, on the uh, slide duty, um, and on this final slide, thank you, Greta. 
There's uh, a few links for where you can get more information. So there's the Fabulous Farmers, the Organic Growers Alliance. And if you're not a member of the Organic Growers Alliance, do join it, although it sort of is or has been predominantly vegetables. I think there's more interest in flowers from the members. And if you're interested in the organic techniques of vegetable growing and plant growing and rotations and fertility and things, the uh, Organic Grower magazine is fantastic. Um, and they have uh, uh, email uh, web forum as well that you can sort of ask questions. So, uh, and a lot of the vegetable growers will also be doing or have been doing some flowers. So that's a great resource. Uh, and obviously the Organic Flower Growers Forum, which Joe has introduced, will be now be happening, at least if maybe just Joe and Jez, but hopefully more of you uh, in January. <laughs>